When you're trapped in an abusive relationship, it feels like you're never going to get out. It feels like you're stuck. It feels like maybe this is the best thing that I can have, or maybe this is the best thing that I deserve. And oftentimes, perspective can get so skewed and focus can get so distorted where you start to view and you start to think that the reality that you're living in of being abused, manipulated by some other person is how life's supposed to be. It's not. And for a period of time, you think you're never going to get out of it. Or you might leave and then you think, I'm never going to be able to get out of the trauma bond or the tie, the feeling that I have for this other person that I know was toxic, that I know was damaging to me. And you feel like you're never going to get out of it. Right here. Here's another person saying it. When you least expect it, you will. And you'll be able to wake up a little bit better each and every day. And it does feel amazing. So a narcissist has to go to therapy on their own. If they're going to go in a group setting where they're with another person, whether in couples therapy or whatever it is, that is not going to be helpful. That is not going to be beneficial. That's going to be damaging to you. And that's going to be opening you up to a world of hurt where the narcissist will actually twist and turn every single thing that the person says to be able to come back to you and to make you the person responsible, to make you the person that is being at blame. You see, couples therapy and working through with counselors counseling with two people is meant for both those people to be trying to get the same thing, a closer bond in marriage, a closer bond in friendship, whatever it is. However, the narcissist isn't looking for that. They're not looking for a closer bond because all they're doing is dealing with supply and trying to manipulate a therapist. That's why I always say, have the narcissist go to therapy on their own for a good period of time. Let's see change, then go from there. That's so true with narcissists. You can't make them change. There's nothing you can do, there's nothing you can say to get them to admit the lies, to get them to admit the manipulation that's happened, to get them to get to the place where they're saying, hey, I actually admit what I've done and I'm sorry, I apologize, I'm going to change my ways. There's nothing you can do. You can't manipulate them back, you can't force them to do something, you can't, nothing. The thing is, it has to come from them. You can give them the tools, you can give them the encouragement, you can give them the boundaries, you can give them the consequences, but ultimately it has to come from them. If a narcissist changed for any other reason except for themselves, except for internally them making that choice, that decision, it's going to be short term. So a lot of times people ask me, like, how do you know a narcissist is going to change? I say consistent change and honest vulnerability. If they don't have those two things, no change. Nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to continue long term. Okay, from a narcissist perspective about death, when a narcissist sees a family member die or sees someone die that is close to them or something like that, next thought in their mind, okay, next. Literally, that's it. Because... In the narcissist's mind, everything is about themselves. Everything is about what I can get, what I can take. That person is no longer worth anything. They're no longer worth supply. They're no longer worth being able to get validation from or whatever you want to call it. But that's just it. And so a narcissist lives very much here in the moment, wants to live life with no regrets, wants to just keep pressing on, moving to the next thing, the next person, the next job, the next opportunity, whatever it might be. And once the past is over, the past is over. Like there's nothing else there. So when someone passes away, when someone dies, there's literally no tears shed, no emotions, nothing. They just move on. Next. There is hope in breaking a trauma bond, but you got to stay no contact. Sometimes people are like, man, I thought I'd be over them. Okay, well, when's the last time you talked to them? Uh, two weeks ago. Or like, hey, I thought I was no contact, but, you know, we ended up like texting a little bit. Like, now I just want to go back. Yes, because you're in a trauma bond. You're in something that is manipulated your emotions, your thoughts, your will to get to the place where you have the right thoughts of, hey, I don't want this person. They're toxic. I need to stay away. But you still want to go back because they're a smooth talker. They're great at manipulating. They're great at future faking and promising a lot of things. But as a result, you get sucked back in. Trauma bonds can be broken. They take time and they take effort. You got to do the work. You got to dig deep. That's why I work with people a lot of times with one-on-ones where we dig deep. We go below the feelings, go below the facts, and develop a story that will help you learn and grow and change to be the best person you can free of that trauma bond. Your narcissist will not block you. 
Your narcissist is not going to block you. You see, you're uh, you're relying and you're asking for the narcissist to have the common de decency, the respect, the care for another human being to actually go in there and block you. What makes you think they're going to do that now? They didn't respect you before. They didn't love you. They didn't care about you. They didn't actually come to a place where they said, hey, I acknowledge you as another human being and I'm willing to meet you halfway. They didn't do that. They're not going to do that now. The reason why they're not going to block you because then they can come back. You can't expect a person who hasn't respected your boundaries, respected your ideas, respected you, loved you, cared about you, to actually do something that you want them to do. They never did while you were together. They're not gonna do it now that you're not together. So the best course of action is to block them, to go no contact, to ghost, to make sure there's no way for them to contact you because they will not block you so they can leave the door open so they can come back. Oftentimes you're looking at somebody who doesn't want to accept help, either because they feel shame or they feel guilt by accepting help, or their pride won't let them. They're supposed to be the best. They're supposed to be the number one person that can do anything or whatever it might be. Uh, I was talking with someone on a one-on-one -on -one the other day, and they mentioned how the narcissist in their life couldn't open this candy bar. And so they walked away for a moment. The person grabbed the candy bar, opened it really easily from one end, set it back down. When the narcissist came back, got super mad, got super angry, because she helped him out. As a result, he turned the candy wrapper over, focused on trying to open it from the opposite end, open it from the opposite end, pull the candy bar up from there, and then ate it. So narcissists do not like to accept help at all because acknowledging that would mean either that they're not number one, uh, that they have flaws or defects, or they are just not a number one person. And so as a result, they're going to push away as much as they can to be able to get to that, whether that's raging or abusing or anything like that for all the people out there that believe that faith and God is going to fix narcissism. It's not. This is not going to get a person to a place that they actually change their actions and believe because you can't function in any type of faith, in any type of reality, if it's just based on lies. If all your reality is based 100% on lies, you have no truth to grow from. You have no truth to be able to launch from, to be able to develop and to be a better person. So when someone is building a foundation that's 100% based on lies, they have no true reality to be able to get to the place that they can admit that they're wrong and start moving towards redemption or start moving towards a better life because of all those lies. For faith to function, there has to be truth. And for a narcissist to hear truth means that their truth is not correct. It means that God is God and not the narcissist. It means that there is right or wrong and not just their own skewed version. Faith can't function on a bed of lies. The gig is up. That's one of the biggest triggers you have from the new supply to the next supply is when they start figuring it out, when they start catching on to your game, when they start figuring out like, hey, something's not right. This is not normal. This is not a normal relationship. Like, why do I feel like I'm the one getting abused? Why do I feel like I'm the one that's like questioning my reality? When the gig is up, when the narcissist starts realizing like, hey, they're starting to catch on, they're pushing back more, they're not taking all my lies as 100% truth, they're not putting up with all my BS, they're not putting up, they're starting to question my gaslighting even more, like I'm starting to be like, this is either not going anywhere, this is becoming an annoying challenge, I've already conquered this challenge, let's move on to the next one, maybe they're bored, like there's a lot of different triggers that can be, but a lot of times it's when the gig is up or when they get bored, when they get to the place they're like, hey, I've already conquered this. I've already accomplished this with this person. Let's go try to find someone else while I still keep this person on the back burner and see what's up. Narcissists don't live lives single. They don't. They don't stay single. They don't develop single. They don't process things single. They have to have a supply. They have to have someone else that's going to be in their lives. So as a result, most of the time people are like, oh, I'm so surprised they went back to this person or they had a new supply like right after we broke up, all this kind of stuff. No, they didn't. They didn't have a new supply. There's never a new one, okay? What there is is there's one narcissist with one person and then there's five other people on the signs that they're lining up. They are setting the, the pieces in motion to be able to have these people as the next person, the fallback, the person after that, the rebound, and the last person just in case everything goes to shit. There's never a surprise with a narcissist. There's never a surprise relationship with a narcissist. All there is is another person in the line of people that they're gonna abuse and manipulate to be able to get their supply, to be able to get what they want and to feel validated by hurting someone else. So I'd say with therapy, there's an aspect of it like trying to help rewire my emotions. Like that's where my emotions are like all over the place. So we had a time where she was doing some 
I don't I don't remember what it was. But basically, she like holds an item and like moves it back and forth. I'm supposed to watch it. She talks to me about like emotion, stuff like that. So my therapist is saying like, hey, like in this moment, I want you to think this. And she's like moving stuff around. And she's like, I want you to think happiness. I want you to think sadness. I want you to think happiness. I want you to think sadness. And like went back and forth. And as we were going back and forth, <clears throat> whenever she would be like, hey, I want you to think happiness, what it was showing on my face was sadness. It was producing tears. It was producing like, whoa. And then she'd say, all right, think sadness. Like it would start to dry up and it would start to be like, okay, I feel okay now. And so as a result, I started like realizing like, hey, a lot of stuff is screwed up. A lot of stuff is miswired. So there's a lot of work that I have to do on my emotions.